Hey YouTube, today we're going to mess around with some spring reverb impulse responses and synthesize our own to make something that sounds mostly like spring reverb. We're going to start with this drum loop. Then we're going to use a real spring reverb impulse response. It sounds like this. Convolvo with the drums in order to make this. Then we're going to make our own version, synthesizing an impulse response from scratch that sounds like this. Before we go too far, we should first talk about what is spring reverb. Here's a picture of a spring reverb tank that I randomly Googled. As you can see, there is an audio input on one side. I'm not sure which side is the input, but that is fed into a transducer that vibrates, takes the electrical signal and turns it into a physical motion, vibrating a spring. As the spring oscillates, it creates an interesting kind of rever reverberation-ish sound. And there's a pickup on the other side, a transducer that turns it back into an electrical signal. And that's how we have spring reverb. So based on the physical characteristics of the springs, number of springs, their tension, their mass, the length of them, etc., you can get totally different sounds. Spring reverb is not a new technology. It's been used for a long time now. Spring reverbs were used a lot in guitar amplifiers to create sort of a portable version of the sound of a room reverberating, or in other applications where you couldn't um, record an actual room reverberating with the sound. It's one example of something that's happened time and time again in music technology, where at first engineers try and reproduce one thing. They tried really hard to create the sound of an acoustic reverberation and didn't quite get there. But now after hearing the sound of spring reverb for decades and decades, we've come to really like kind of the quirks of spring reverb. And the what was once thought of defects of spring reverb is now something that we in software go out of our way to recreate because it's become part of the music culture. I first started noticing spring reverb in particular after following the 60 Cycle Hum YouTube channel. Ryan at 60 Cycle Hum uh, loves different guitar effects. In particular, he loves spring reverb, which makes sense because he plays surf rock and it's a really important part of that sound. In particular, he's interested in drippy reverb. I'm not entirely sure I know what that means, but some of these reverb sounds are great. Let's take a listen real quick. Okay, so lots of different kinds of sounds, but you can hear uh, what he describes as drip, where it almost sounds kind of springy. Um, now I'll be honest, I'm not really an expert in spring reverb or how it works, um, but we don't really have to understand how it works exactly to kind of dig in and analyze the sound of it and see if we can recreate a version of it. So as I showed in my last video, you can create a lot of echo-like effects using convolution. If you have the impulse response of some kind of echo or reverberation, you can apply the sound of that impulse response to an input audio signal. Now this is used a lot in audio production where people will uh, basically sample a reverb or a reverb effect by sending in some kind of an impulse, which can be a really short, loud sound, or there are other techniques that are more sophisticated to measure an impulse. If you give this impulse as the input to a system that is linear, which is a specific technical definition, then theoretically you can create the same output using convolution. Now, spring reverb in practice probably isn't entirely linear, but we can get pretty close to it uh, just for our purposes. So to start on our journey of 
simulating Spring Reverb, I first just Googled to see if we can find some Spring Reverb impulse responses to download. And I found this blog, Dubism, where it looks like we have some different reverb impulse responses that we can get. Uh, and it sounds like what uh, this person is trying to do is uh, create some dub uh, type reverbs, old school Jamaican style. So first I downloaded their impulse responses and that brought me to this folder. So let's play some of these back. Wow, that one's kind of distorted. Okay, that one's nice and springy. Yeah, so we get a pretty similar sound to what we got in the 60 cycle hum video, which is basically sending kind of an impulse into these reverbs and uh, listening to how they respond to that kind of signal. So let's load up Spider and uh, put some impulse responses together. First in this file, we basically have the same imports from the previous time, uh, NumPy for numerical operations, matplotlib for plotting. Uh, we have some signal processing functions from SciPy that we can use, as well as some wave file uh, inputs and outputs from SciPy. Now here I'm defining a variable that shows the path or the file name of one of the impulse responses that I want to use. So I'm using the king tubby fl2a from the folder that we downloaded. And I've converted this to float32 in Audacity, um, just to simplify some of the processes before loading this in Python. I also have the path to a drum loop, a drum sample that I got from a sample library um, that I'll be using as the input to this. And then I have two functions uh, that I've defined, um, db to mag, decibels to magnitude. It's just a function that takes one variable, does 10 to the power of that over 20, or magnitude to decibels, which converts um, from magnitude to decibels. The formula for that is 20 times log 10 of the input. I've kind of styled these after the mag2db function from MATLAB. Uh, you can see on this page, their documentation, they have the formula for this. Decibels version is 20 log 10. Now the reason why we want this is because when we're working in signal processing, we can often want to work on signals that are both very loud and very quiet very high amplitude and very low amplitude. And when we work in decibel scale, it makes it easier to work at those two levels at the same time. So these will be simple utility functions to convert between the two. Also, a lot of times in audio production, you'll see parameters listed as decibels, uh, different gain settings in DAWs or plugins will be listed in decibels. So this will help us speak that language. So the first thing I'll do is run this cell. Now we'll import all of our packages that we're depending on and create the variables for the paths and in the functions to convert between decibels and magnitude. Now that we've got some of the inputs out of the way, we can start loading the audio files. Uh, one thing that's handy in Spider is you can use this pound sign percent percent to define a cell or a section. This is kind of borrowed from MATLAB, but the idea is when you're working with the script interactively, it can be handy to rerun just one section of the code at a time. So if you do this, you can get a keyboard shortcut that runs only this section that you have highlighted in yellow. So to start, let's read the WAV file for the King Tubby impulse response that we have in this string up here. Um, in this file, there were a lot of zeros that um, were at the end of the file. They kind of made it more computationally intensive than it needed to be uh, to apply these impulse responses. So this line is just me saying, um, find the indexes where the impulse response is not equal to zero and then uh, assign the variable to the variable at those points. So this is basically just gonna crop out the beginning and the ending that have all zeros. Then let's load the drum loop. So the parameters we'll get back are the sampling rate and the drum signal. Now this audio file is stereo, and for our purposes, uh, we'll mostly be working with mono audio. So this line just says, keep every sample from the first audio channel which I believe is the left channel. And then just to be sure, um, we'll want to be working at a single sampling rate. So let's assert that the sampling rate from our first impulse response is the same as the one we get from the drums. Otherwise, uh, let's throw an error because we'll want to catch that sooner rather than later. Okay, let's run just that much and make sure that it's working. Okay, after running that, let's check out our variables. 
So we have the sampling rate for the drums file, 44.1 kilohertz. The sampling rate for the impulse response is 44.1 kilohertz as well, so that's great. We have the drum signal as float 32. We can see the size of it, it's pretty big. And the uh, impulse response signal is also type float 32. We can see the size of it here. And we can see that both of these signals are within the range of minus one to positive one. So we won't clip um, on any of these files so far. So that's great. Okay, so let's do some signal processing with these. The first thing we'll wanna do if we have this impulse response and we want to apply it to this drum loop is to convolve it. Now you can use the NumPy version of convolve, uh, which I used in the last video. That does a time domain convolution, if you know what that means. If you don't know what that means, it's totally fine. In SciPy, we can use a frequency domain convolution. Um, using the fast Fourier transform. Um, it's okay if you don't know what that means, but basically um, for a lot of cases, if you do some pre-processing, you can compute the convolution of two signals a lot faster than you could otherwise. Um, so that's what the FFT convolve function is here that I'm using. So if we run this, we can see that we get a new signal called wet signal, which is a terminology that's used a lot in audio processing, just meaning the version of the signal that has an effect applied to it. We see it's also type float 32, and we see that the size of it is longer than either the drum signal or the impulse response that we have, but it's pretty close in size to the drum signal. Uh, in fact, in convolution, the size of the output is going to be the sum of the sizes of the two inputs minus one. So we can see that that's the case here, that this one is these two values added together minus one. We can see here though that the range of this signal is uh, a lot wider than our range of minus one to positive one. Um, so we'll want to scale this down so that we don't clip on the output. If we wrote this to a file and played it back, it would be super distorted. Um, so we'll want to scale that down a little bit. So I have a line that I wrote before that just says, uh, let's take the wet signal, divide by the maximum absolute value in it and assign that again to the wet signal. So this is a process called normalizing, where what this will give us is uh, the wet signal where the largest absolute value is one. And this will ensure that we don't clip when we play it back through audio software, because it usually expects this range from minus one to positive one as the maximum amplitudes. So if we run this and check out our variables, we can see now that the largest absolute value in the signal the largest absolute value is one, um, but the minimum is negative one, the maximum is 0.934. So that's great. This signal won't clip anymore if we play this back on its own. Now what I want to do next is add this wet signal to our original input, but that will only work if these two signals are the same size. So we know that the uh, signal that we created is larger than the input signal. So if we want to add these together with NumPy arrays, they'll need to be the same size. So you can decide to do this in different ways. Um, what I've decided to do here is just concatenate some zeros to the end of the input signal. And the length of it needs to be um, the length of the wet signal uh, minus the length of the input signal. We'll make sure that these are the same sizes. So if we run that, you can see that that gets us a dry signal that's the same size as the wet signal, so that's great. And then I wanna create an output signal. That's the dry signal plus the wet signal scaled by some value. So I'm choosing, uh, to scale it down by minus six dB. Um, and if we run this, we can see that minus six dB is about 50% amplitude. So it'd be about the same as multiplying it by 0.5. So let's run this line. And then I wanna write the mix of these signals and just the wet version to files. Oops, just realized I mixed up these variables. Let's try that again, rerun the section. Go check out the files. Uh, first, let's listen to the mix version. All right, we have a good spring reverb sound on our drums now. Now, if you listen closely, you can hear that kind of drip sound that we were talking about uh, from the 60 cycle hum channel, kind of the springiness, especially after the snare drum. Now we should be able to hear it especially well if we listen to uh, just the wet signal. Oh, 
okay, that's great and all, but what exactly is going on in that impulse response? Uh, let's draw some plots to check it out. So I have a new section in the code here so that we can plot the impulse response of this. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is plot this in the time domain, plot the impulse response signal in the time domain that is. First thing I want to do is make an array that shows all the points in time of each sample of the signal so we can draw it on the plot. Uh, we can do this with uh, NumPy A range, which like the Python built-in range, fun range function, takes um, the length of the array to create and um, creates values that go between zero and one minus that length. If we do that divided by the sampling rate, we will get all of the points in time that correspond to the samples in the signal. Uh, let's plot, make a new figure. And then let's plot on the x-axis, this time array, on the y-axis, the uh, King Tubby impulse response signal. Uh, let's make a grid with some light colors, kind of a light gray, uh, and then draw the title and then labels for the axes. So if we run this section, oops, just realize it says spectrogram. This one is time domain. All right, let's try that again. And I just realized this is time in seconds. Okay, now if we look at this plot, you can see that we have an audio signal that is kind of an exponential decay, starting out pretty loud and decaying to very low value. Uh, the length of it is about five seconds long. Now, if we zoom in closer to the beginning of this, about the first one second, uh, we can see that there are, at the beginning, kind of some discrete echoes uh, that kind of stand out. So if we zoom into the first 400 milliseconds, we can see this trend that happens about every 50 or 60 milliseconds or so. Uh, where we have this louder signal kind of starting. Let's zoom in on the first two. Now, if you know what you're looking for here, you can almost see that at the beginning of each of these echoes, there's sort of more lower frequency information. You can see this period and this period are pretty low frequency, but as it gets to the end of this echo cycle, uh, we have more higher frequency information. And if we pan through this, we can see that that's kind of a recurring trend. Now, if we're interested in looking at trends and frequency, uh, this kind of plot isn't really the right way to look at it. So let's instead draw the spectrogram, which I have prepared down here. So let's make a new figure. We'll use the matplotlib specgram function. Uh, here I'm using the parameters NFFT is 512, overlap is 500, uh, minimum, let's set that to minus 100 dB actually. And if you don't know what these mean, not a big deal. But the main parameter to keep in mind here is NFFT. Uh, the larger this is, the more resolution we'll get in frequency. We'll be able to tell different frequencies apart easier, um, but they'll be kind of smeared across time. If this number is smaller, we'll get more precision in time, but we'll get more smearing across frequency. And kind of a fundamental part of signal processing is that um, you can't really have perfect information of when a signal happened and what its frequency is. We call it time frequency uncertainty. Uh, and that kind of comes up here. You can trade off how much do you want to know about the signal's um, frequency and how much do you want to know about uh, where those frequencies happen in time. And I kind of played with this and I think 512 works pretty well for us. So if we draw this plot, first of all, we get this. So we can see again that we have a signal that is about five seconds long. We have the time on the x-axis. Now we have the frequency on the y-axis going from zero to uh, about 22,000 hertz. We have this color scale that shows us yellow are the strongest frequencies, the strongest bends of time and frequency rather, and dark blue means that there is almost no signal there. So we can see that almost all the interesting stuff is happening over here. So if we zoom in uh, from about 10K to zero hertz, and then uh, zero to one seconds, we can see kind of more of what's going on here. Now we can see kind of that trend that we were looking for before. Uh, where you can see the change in uh, the frequency of the signal over time. And we can see that it's repeating, again, about every 50 or 60 milliseconds for a while. Let's zoom in even tighter, first 200 milliseconds. And we can see, okay, something pretty wild's happening here. You can see that there's sort of a chirp where we have um, almost like a sinusoidal, like a sine wave um, going from starting about uh, maybe 400-ish hertz uh, you can see the y equals at the bottom showing where my cursor is and then going up to about uh, 4,000 hertz um, over about 50 milliseconds and then you can see that at the next time we have the signal increasing in a similar way 
Now, if we pan to the right on this, uh, we can see that this signal flattens out. Interestingly, the slope of that line changes and eventually it just kind of blurs into an echo where you can't even uh, really tell where that original sine wave was. So if we zoom back out, maybe not that far, if you look at about the first two seconds, you can see that it has the effect of uh, first letting in more higher frequencies, maybe up to about 4,000 hertz, and then slowly the higher frequency information kind of fades out and we have more of a lower frequency signal. So this is why the reverb, um, the mixed version of our signal has kind of a darker reverb sound where we don't have that much high frequencies getting through. You can see that most of this impulse response is really dark, meaning the higher frequencies won't get through when we apply this with convolution. Now, a lot of this is pretty standard in reverb, um, this kind of decaying where the higher frequencies don't decay as much and the lower frequencies do. Um, and that'll be pretty common in most reverbs. Uh, but what I think is really interesting about the spring reverb is this kind of, this energy going from lower to higher and then oscillating downward. That's so weird. That doesn't happen in a lot of different kinds of reverbs. And I think that's what is most distinctive to me, at least, uh, in spring reverb. So let's see if we can uh, go after just this trend. Can we create something that is at least a rough approximation of this signal kind of increasing like that? Okay, so here in a new part of the code, I've uh, started with some parameters. So we'll make the echo period in seconds about 55 milliseconds or 55 times 10 to the minus three, which is about kind of what we were seeing in the other spectrogram. Uh, we'll make two variables for where we want to start our sweep, uh, kind of our chirp across the frequencies. Uh, let's start it at 200 hertz and then end that at three kilohertz or three times 10 to the three. Let's say we wanna do 30 of those for now, just to start. First thing we'll want to do is uh, convert this period in seconds to samples. So if we multiply it by the sampling rate, uh, that might be a fractional number. So just to make things easy, let's round it. Uh, so we get that in terms of samples. We can get the length of our impulse response that we want um, just by multiplying the number of echoes times this period. And then um, we can create a array where we'll start to put our signal. If we use uh, NP zeros, it will be initialized to all zeros, and let's give it the length that we want. The first thing we'll want to do here is create the frequency trend that we want. So this will give us the sweep um, uh, frequency envelope starting from this low frequency to this high frequency um, with this number of samples. So uh, we can use linspace to get that. So if we run all of this, we can pull this up in the variable explorer and see that the smallest number is 200 and it's gradually increasing until 3000. So to create the audio signal that has this frequency trend, we'll need to use uh, NumPy cumulative sum on this frequency envelope. Now, if you're familiar with calculus, you'll know that this is similar to doing an integral. Uh, so the frequency is basically the rate of the change in phase that we want. And if we integrate it, then we can get the phase that corresponds to that. If you don't know about calculus, that's totally fine. Um, basically what this is doing is converting from the frequency to a phase. We'll need to divide by the sampling rate and multiply by two pi, uh, and then that will give us the sine wave that we're interested in. So if we run this, then we can draw a plot of it. What we end up with is known as a chirp signal in signal processing, um, starting with low frequency, and then as time increases, uh, we get to higher and higher frequency. So that's great, that's what we wanted. Now what we want to do is copy the signal uh, several different times with each of them kind of decaying in amplitude. So to do this, we can initialize our echo first to be minus one dB and then iterate through uh, the number of echoes times the period of each echo. Um, we can get the index that we we'll want to put this at um, by creating a range array, the length of this sweep signal at the echo index. So if we index our impulse response signal at these indices um, and then add to this value the amplitude of our echo times the sweep signal and then scale our amplitude down each time uh, by minus 1.2 dB um, just to make the echo quieter as time goes on. So if we run all of this section and plot our impulse response, you can see that we end up with a much longer signal than we had before. If we zoom into a few of the echoes, you can see it starts with low frequency and increases. 
We have a bunch of those decaying in amplitude. Let's start with first just writing this to a file and listening to it. Okay, one more time. Crazy, that doesn't sound anything like <laughs> any reverb. Okay, now let's apply it to the drum signal. So here I'm doing the FFT Convolve, again, just because it's a little faster than the time domain one to get wet signal. Um, this is gonna be super loud, so let's scale it down by 32 dB. Again, we'll need to zero pad it before we can add this to the dry signal. Uh, then we can add it to the dry signal scaled down by 6 dB. And then we can create the mix of this. So let's run all of that and give it a listen. Pretty crazy. Sounds like an interesting special effect. Let's compare it again to the, uh, the impulse response that we downloaded. So they sound pretty different. We haven't totally recreated it yet, but you can see how, uh, at least when you listen to the snare drum on the original version, uh, you have something that's kind of similar sounding. Even though our impulse response doesn't really sound exactly like a spring reverb, the advantage of this is we can go crazy with these parameters and create something that sounds totally different. So let's set the number of echoes to five, make the period 100 milliseconds, and keep everything else the same. Let's run that and see what happens. Now that's pretty wild. Definitely doesn't sound like spring reverb at all anymore, but you could see how in the right context that would make an interesting special effect. Now to get at how we might make this a little bit more realistic, we can jump over to another script that I've made before uh, that I used to prepare for this. The code for this is a little bit of a mess, but you can see that it has a so similar sort of structure. Um, one thing that I found that makes this effect a lot more realistic is if we scale the sweep to be much quieter at the end at the higher frequencies than at the lower frequencies. So here I'm multiplying the sweep at the beginning by zero dB, so keeping it the same amplitude, and then at the end by minus 80 dB uh, with a linear trend. So that keeps the reverb sounding kind of um, a little bit darker, a little bit more subdued. Um, as we go through the loop, I added um, basically an impulse to each loop at kind of a low magnitude. Uh, which gives a copy of the input signal without kind of the sine wave effect to it. Um, also a pretty big change, I'm using a uh, normally distributed random signal, so Gaussian noise, um, which starts being even at all frequencies and decaying this uh, to minus 60 dB over the length of the impulse response, which I've made um, now to be twice the length of these numbers of echoes. Um, this sounds a little bit better, a little bit more like a realistic reverb effect on its own. Um, it sounds a lot brighter than the impulse response we're trying to recreate. So then I made a low pass filter of order 60, uh, cut off frequency 300 hertz, and then applied that to um, just this white noise signal um, to kind of um, chill out the higher frequencies on that. Uh, then I add the noise signal to the sine wave chirps and then apply it with convolution. If we listen to that. It's even a little bit hard to hear the chirps in there. Maybe if we turn those up, I change this value from minus 80 to minus 40. Let's run this again.
yeah, so that's a little bit more realistic. Now let's compare it to the, uh, the original one we're going for. Yeah, so it's not the same impulse response, but you know, it sounds kind of like a, it's a simulation. If we plot the spectrograms of the King Tubby impulse response on the left and our synthetic one on the right, uh, you can see there are some similarities, uh, but there are also some serious differences. Uh, let me change that parameter back that I did before. Yeah, so we'll make the ending amplitude uh, minus 80 again for our synthetic impulse response. There, now that kind of calms the, uh, the higher frequency parts of these chirps down. So you can see there's some definite similarities where uh, the chirp signals are kind of increasing and they're decaying in amplitude. Uh, the big difference is these are kind of a curve. Uh, these are really a straight line. You could definitely write the code that makes them curve. I just wanted to keep this kind of simple. Uh, what you'd want to do is probably make these curves um, sort of flatten out over time. As you can see, uh, it starts with these being kind of really steep slope and then kind of decaying down. Whereas in our version, you can see uh, that they kind of have the same slope all the way, which maybe makes it sound a little bit more synthetic and less realistic. Um, one thing that I kind of like about ours, though, uh, I think the the impulse response that we're using sounds kind of muddy, and I would probably attribute that to um, all this energy in about 100 frequency-ish range, um, whereas ours is a lot more uniform across the low and mid range, which I think um, sounds a little bit less muddy and works a little bit better with the kick drum of the sound. Hopefully you can see how this is the beginning of a much longer process where you might uh, change the algorithms, tweak some of the parameters, uh, but also change kind of the slope of the chirp or a lot of other parameters uh, to get closer and closer to the impulse response that we want. I think what's exciting about using this approach is that you can change these knobs to go in a totally different direction. And now what we have basically is an impulse response generator uh, with sweeps and a decaying white noise and you could get a huge range of sounds other than just trying to reproduce a single impulse response. While some of these sound kind of wacky at first, for sure, I think it's important to keep in mind where we came from, where we're emulating a spring reverb, which is emulating an acoustic reverb. And we know that the spring reverb doesn't really sound like acoustic reverb, um, just in the same way that our simulation doesn't really sound like spring reverb. But put in the right artistic context, maybe uh, you could really make an impact with this that kind of stands out, and maybe it could even become as popular as Spring Reverb someday. Thanks for watching this video. I got a lot of feedback uh, from my survey that I sent out before that said that people are interested in more complex demos. So uh, this is certainly more complex than anything else I've ever put on this channel. Hopefully it's an insight into how you might actually start to design these kinds of algorithms and show you what this would look like more on uh, a higher level than just the intro material that I've done before. Let me know what you thought of this. I'm uh, trying out some more stuff in OBS. Hopefully this video has better frame rate than the previous one that I did. I hope this format's clear. I hope not too much of it uh, kind of went over people's heads if you're beginners at this. Let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to dig more into some of the stuff that I glossed over here. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to leave comments about any other things that you're interested in me digging into and uh, stick around for more. Thanks.